I'm Tim Malloy with the Palm Beach Civic Association and this is Palm Beach TV, your island's newscast. This is an exciting time for the Civic Association's 76th season with our sponsorship program growing. We're pleased to announce the newest sponsor, the Fortin Foundation of Florida. They're the sponsors of the newscast that we bring you week after week this season. We extend our gratitude to the Fortin Foundation of Florida. And now, our newscast. We begin with the town council in the peak of the season talking about the marina, the big project. It is front and center. Here's reporter Wendy Rutledge. Tim, it was a packed house at the February town council meeting where residents on both sides of the issue, as well as town staffers and several marina experts all came to the podium in what ended up being about a two hour, very lively debate about the docks renovation project. But in the end, Town council members all came together and voted to move forward on the $31 million bond to fund the Marina Improvement Project. Originally built in the 1940s, the town docks have seen a few renovations, the most recent of which was 22 years ago in 1998. For the past three years, Palm Beach Town Council and town staff have spent thousands of man hours and at least $1.8 million shaping a new renovation project that would include more spaces for larger yachts up to 296 feet. Few would argue the aging marina needs an update. What did draw many concerned citizens to council chambers today were issues of cost, inflated revenue estimates, overdevelopment, loss of adjacent green space, and increased traffic. Where are all these cars going to go? Where are the trucks going to go? The street is full of trucks already. That the council take a breath to re-examine and digest both the cost considerations, which may also not be current, as well as the revised revenue expectations, so that we don't rush to judgment on this process. Specifically, concerned residents turned out to request that town council members postpone a decision to go forward with financing for the docks in the form of a $31 million bond. Should council have postponed that vote, it would have jeopardized a $3.1 million grant toward construction and much more. We would start the whole process all over again. If we made design changes to the docks, we'd have to start the process all over, resubmit to the Army Corps of Engineers, um, resubmit to the, the state for a submerged land lease, and uh, we're already tens of thousands of hours into this. Supporters of the dock project pressed for moving forward. And to the planning of this project is, is exemplary. I encourage the town council to move forward with this project. Uh, you've got the grant money coming in. I think that the sooner you get started, the city will be able to move forward in, in finalizing the plans for the park of the parking. And I have all the confidence in the world in this council that you'll do the appropriate thing. Council members tried to reassure skeptics of their commitment to do the right thing for neighbors and residents impacted by the dock project. This is a, going to be not only a revenue source, which is important to me, but a beautification project equally as important. We're, we're not going to miss the opportunity while we're, you know, going to take, do a redo, a much needed redo of some very decrepit uh, docks. That don't, the power is going out three times a week right now. But we're not going to miss the opportunity to look and say, how can we improve the parking, the traffic, the aesthetic, the security, the landscaping, the lighting. It would be unconscionable that anyone sitting up here would ever do the docks and make it class A and not do the park and not look at the parking. And by the way, there is no loss of green space. There, it, let's just get that over with right now. There will not be a loss of green space. <clears throat> While a public hearing is set for February 24th at 10 a.m. to discuss parking, aesthetics, and other community concerns, the council unanimously voted to move forward on the $31 million bond funding for the DOCS project with this vote. Ms. Lindsay? Yes. Mr. Crampton? Aye. Ms. Ariscoff? Yes. Ms. Zeidman? Yes. Ms. Moore. Yes. After the vote, Town Council President Danny Moore had this to say, and I quote, 
I think it is a vital project for the future of the town and am pleased that the town council ruled on it unanimously. So there you have it. Thumbs up going forward on the Marina Improvement Project. President Trump will be spending the weekend in Palm Beach at Mar-a-Lago and the usual roadway and marine rules will be enforced. The precise schedule is never released for obvious security reasons, but the FAA has put flight restrictions in place beginning Friday. The customary traffic advisories apply during the closure period. All forms of travel, including pedestrian travel, are prohibited on South Ocean Boulevard from the intersection of South County Road to Southern Boulevard. Travel restrictions will also extend eastward to the ocean. If you're a resident living south of South Ocean Boulevard and South County intersection, you will be granted access with proper credentials. If you are driving, you are urged to use the Royal Park or Flagler Memorial Bridges, the alternative being the Lake Worth Bridge to the south. And marine security zones will be in effect for the entire visit. It's an iconic part of the island where we live. Just the name conjures elegance and visions of a bygone era. But the Breakers is a very modern and evolving place. And the man in charge happens to be a director of the Palm Beach Civic Association. I sat down with Paul Leone. Still cannot wait to come to work every day. And you mean that, I could tell. Oh, I mean it. I'm running over here. I'm skipping over here. <laughs> over here is this magnificent five-star hotel, arguably the jewel in the crown of all of Palm Beach. Paul Leone marked his 35th year at the Breakers on his birthday, February the 4th of this year. He says his childhood set the stage for where he is now. My first experience in Paris, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. I'm in 10th grade. My parents buy the Starlight Motel, a classic little motel name, right? These little roadside motels all over the country. That was the original hospitality business. It was a modest but earnest beginning. I promise you that the first day I stood behind the front desk and checked someone in and played with the switchboard and, and um, I really, um, I, you know, something struck me about it. And then, of course, the next day I'm cleaning toilets and making beds. That wasn't as much fun, but, but uh, you know. Filling the, the soda machine. Yeah, <laughs> filling the soda machine. And then I got in the kitchen, and I really enjoyed, you know, every aspect of the restaurant business. So, you know, started in the mom and pop. Right. And which is nothing like, of course, the breakers. But the thing that they have in common is our guests in that 17-room motel, they were like guests in our home. They still are. It's just a much bigger and more elegant house. 425 rooms and suites. The main so familiar structure built in 1926 it is a workplace for 2,400 people locally. One of the county's biggest employers. Paul Leone affectionately likens them in military terms to a battalion which is getting full support from the top. We put our team first and I mean this. This is not a program. It's not a motto. It's definitely not an act. The reason our team performs at a level that is off the charts is because they know we care about them and we're in this together. And, um, and so it's a huge responsibility. Our payroll is, uh, you know, approaching $100 million um, to do what we do. And it's the best investment we could ever make is, is doing more for our team, taking better care of them. The Breakers is owned by the heirs of Henry Morrison Flagler and the loyal gatekeeper is Paul Leone. Starting small in this rural homey motel in Paris, Kentucky, he now oversees a hotel resort that rivals anything in Paris, France, or anywhere else for that matter. He says, a treasure worth preserving. We just talk about um, protecting this thing into the future I infinitely. The Keenans have no desire to ever sell this. Mm -hmm. And so when I really think about 30, 40, 50 years from now, I think about this still being an independent hotel in the hands of the same family doing something that's really unmatched in our business. We all appreciate the tremendous work our police and fire personnel do here on the island of Palm Beach. They want to share their knowledge by letting us walk in their shoes, so to speak. Reporter Wendy Rutledge now joins other trainees at the Police and Fire Academy. Hey Tim, I'm here for the Police and Fire Academy week one. I am all set along with about 20 other Palm Beach residents to learn everything we might want to know about police and fire rescue, the inside scoop. So I've got my shirt, I have got my notebook, and I can tell you what we are going to learn today. It's going to be brought to us by the police department this week, week one. We're going to learn about communications, criminal investigations, 
internet and social media safety. So a packed afternoon, we'll keep you posted. Police Chief Nick Caristo kicked off the 2020 Police and Fire Foundation Citizens Academy with his usual warmth and good humor. Then we dove right in. So this Citizens Academy is the reason we want to get you, we want you to have a better understanding of what we do and how you can contribute and help us in the past. Normally, the later the night goes on, the less people you're going to see. And when you do see people at 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, usually they're up to no good. Police officer Giselle Bido, one of eight women on the 66-person police force, began by enlightening us about the 30 pounds of gear she wears every single day on her belt. First thing you're going to notice is my magazines. These are um, completely loaded, and this is um, these are my backups. All right. The next thing you're going to notice is my taser, there, which you guys will be all using tasers in a few weeks so <laughs> so don't be scared um, this taser which I'm not gonna pull out already has a cartridge loaded in it this is the spare cartridge so if the first cartridge doesn't work all I have to do is flip this up put my taser gun in and the second cartridge is already on there this is a very dedicated officer who joined the police force after her sister was taken hostage at a local law firm she and fellow officers have dealt with harrowing life and death situations, one involving a young man holding a shotgun to his mouth. I lowered my gun so he could look at my face and I talked to him. Uh, it took about, sorry, my voice is getting, it's a little bit yeah, yeah. Um, really? I didn't know this, but I was talking to him for 13 minutes trying to get him to put the gun down. So, oh. um, it felt like an hour. <laughs> um, finally, he was able to put the gun down on the floor, put his hands up and kick it away. And at that point I ran up to him and I hugged him and my partner Kevin grabbed the shotgun and when he racked it, a shell fell out. <laughs> That's how I started my day <laughs> at 5.45 in the morning. Inspirational stories from officers, just part of the reason these Palm Beach residents were called to join this Citizens Academy. I love Palm Beach and I love where we live. And I thought that I should know what's happening and. These guys are great. You call any certain 911 and you don't even hang up the phone and there they are. I wanted Sir, to know how do they accomplish this. Um, right now, if I arrested someone, let's say I arrested you, ma'am. Literally traveling behind the scenes, we were paraded down, down, down to the concrete holding cell area for a sobering look. It's fascinating. Yeah, I kind of went down to see those cells. I got claustrophobic. <laughs> <laughs> Sobering. Yeah, you don't realize what the people are going through. Normal jail cell where someone would be staying, if they have a holding, they have holding cells where they put multiple people in. So then we crammed into Command Central, the communications room where the island's 140 live cameras are monitored 24-7. Police and fire rescue calls all come to this spot. Teams of call takers and dispatchers working round the clock to keep us safe. The vehicle was purpose of committing a crime. Uh, Theft is a different thing. It's a physical removal of an object. Yes, that was just a purse snatching. A mock crime designed to teach us how tough it is to describe a suspect. Was he wearing a black shirt and white shorts? Six feet tall? Muscular or stocky? I said a white hat on crooked, white t-shirt, medium height, dark hair, 29 okay. to 34 years old, slightly stocky. Tremendous planning, great storytelling, and a true exhibition of professionalism were all on display at week one of the 2020 Police and Fire Foundation Citizens Academy. Next week, it's Fire Rescue on deck, and we'll be there. Now we continue our segment we call Our Gardens, this time a beautiful home on the north end of the island, which is benefiting by the absence of pesticides used on the property. Our photographer Mitchell Friesen took a walk with homeowner Linda Beatty. But the idea here was a butterfly garden. I didn't know, I didn't understand the importance of uh, natives at that point. Not the importance, the necessity of natives. And um, I made a butterfly garden. Still not fully understanding what I needed to be doing. Um, but as I did understand, I did begin to uh, grow native. Basically what I'm trying to accomplish 
in my gardens is to grow things that I can tell other Palm Beachers, this works, this doesn't work, um, this looks good, this you want to use only if you're willing to uh, have it not look so good part of the year. Uh, can I show you the other garden now? Okay, this garden is much more of an experiment than the other one. And my gardens are always <laughs> fluctuating, being changed. Um, here's the frog fruit. This is the most wonderful ground cover, but it's host to at least four different butterflies. Very small ones, but all part of the chain and very necessary. Look! Oh, I don't know what it is. Come. I need to look it up to see what it is, but it's very special. Oh, that's exciting. Green, this is, oh, oh, hello. Oh, he's beautiful. This is scorpion tail. Uh, and it's like the rouge plant in that you only need to buy one, <laughs> you'll have lots. And it pops up all over my garden anywhere. Uh, it's also very easy to pull out if it's growing where you don't want it. But I often let it just grow up. It's necessary, I call it Viagra for the male, it's very necessary for the male butterfly. So it's a great one to have in your butterfly garden. This is a very old buttonwood uh, tree. As you all know, it's one of uh, the garden club's top 10 for replacing your ficus hedges. This one has been allowed to grow into a tree and it's probably the buttonwood, both the silver and the green, are probably our very most important uh, natives that we can all plant. You see how beautiful the, the bark is? It's home to piles of uh, insects. And I know we've all been told that insects are bad, but they're not. Even bad insects are good because they're food for the good insects, the beneficial insects. We need the whole chain. Um, and then you'll notice that behind it, we have the Calusia. And let me... Uh, take this time to say, please don't plant any more Calusia. We have overdone it in Palm Beach. The Everglades is begging, please. They are getting, birds are dropping the seeds in the Everglades and they've really got a problem. Um, it is not native. There is a very different Calusia that is native down in, Key, in the Keys, but not mainland Florida. We, we need to stop. Oh, and, and let me add that everything in this yard, I use no pesticides uh, and I use very little fertilizer and have now decided to use absolutely none. And the fertilizer I used was uh, chicken poop and fish emulsion. And I thought, well, at least those are better and not hurting our waterways. But mm, the experts that we had at the last Songbird program looked at me when I asked them if they were okay and said, why are you using anything? If your plants need fertilizer, maybe they don't belong in your, la your yard. Some of these natives, especially the wildflowers, you have to appreciate small things. Linda Beatty is an active participant in the very successful Songbirds Initiative. She's also a member of the Palm Beach Civic Association's Environmental Committee. The sandbreaking ceremony for the new $25 billion beach nourishment project in town was celebrated at Town Council by Mayor Coniglio. It's a whole lot of sand, 700,000 cubic yards of it, between Casa Bendita and Banyan Road. 2.8 miles. It's been five years since the Midtown Beach has been given a facelift, and this is it. The town is the beneficiary of a sizable grant to the tune of $25 million. A more stable beach protects the homes that are in front of it. This week was a great week for Civic Association members who attended our Global Series program with keynote speaker Buzzy Krongard. 128 supporting benefactor members enjoyed the program. Here are a few remarks from Buzzy Krongard, along with his insight as the former number three at the CIA, 
You can also watch the entire program on our website. I used to speak to all the incoming classes. And I always said, if you remember nothing else from what I'm going to tell you, remember this. If you are a woman, your makeup mirror. If you are a man, your shaving mirror. Every morning you look in this. On it, you put a piece of adhesive tape, and on it you write, we do intelligence, we do not do policy. Because I am utterly convinced that any time you get embroiled in policy, it will skew, consciously or unconsciously, your handling of intelligence to conform to the policy side you're on. When intelligence is working well, it's doing two things. First, it informs and elevates the policy debate, ensuring that all parties are working from the same information. It helps to bound the uncertainties that surround every policy choice. And second, at the end of the day, it makes our guy smarter than their guy, whether that's across a mahogany conference table or a battlefield somewhere in Central Asia. And finally, this request from the Civic Association has to do with our lost drone. Actually, we know where it is. It's just way up in a tree. So we have this request. Our chief photographer, uh, Philip Baldwin, was shooting the marina the other day. And he got up to a certain height and uh, got caught in the wind. He picks up the story from here. This is the last footage from the drone. I was shooting new drone shots of the town dock for the story earlier in this broadcast. I had not realized when it was rising in elevation that the wind was pushing it away from me. So instead of coming back to me, it perched 123 feet up in a royal palm along the seawall. The next time the tree is trimmed, it'll probably still be there. So hopefully, either a tree trimmer or someone nice over by the marina will see this little thing flutter down and give us a call. If not, it's okay, but we'd love to get it back. So we're at palmbeachcivic.org if you find our drone. And it's one of the reasons we've got all these cool pictures we're taking in town these days. I'm Tim Malloy from the Palm Beach Civic Association where membership matters. If you are a member, we hope you'll renew your membership. If you're not, we hope you'll join us. We'll see you hopefully with a drone next week.